Good evening, everyone. And uh, we're back in the book of Isaiah, and we are here in chapter 3. And in chapter 3, and actually chapter 3 and chapter 4 uh, goes hand in hand. Uh, it, it, it's an entire chapter, but unfortunately, it's broken up into two chapters. And I am proposing to actually finish off chapter 3 in verse 17. And on Monday, we will wrap up the rest of chapter 3 and then chapter 4 uh, so that we, we can actually have enough for, for two days. So we will not spend too long in chapter 3 today and we will leave the balance from verse 18 onwards to Monday together with chapter 4. Now, every time we do a chapter in the Old Testament, uh, particularly like this in the, um, the prophet books, and right now we're doing the book of Isaiah, and the, the, the thing that you've seen in Isaiah so far in chapter 1 and chapter 2 yesterday is that we are not looking at things in a chrono chronological fashion. In fact, what we're seeing in chapter 1, 2, and now chapter 3 has very much to do with uh, Jerusalem and Judah, uh, primarily from the fact that it is now after the fall of the northern kingdom. Uh, we have seen in our previous books that the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom has, have both actually committed Hamas, meaning violence and injustice, and God is now taking an account for what they have done. In chapter 3, as we begin today, uh, I would hope to show you uh, a more imagery-centric message. Rather than reading the words, um, follow with me as much as you can and imagine what God is describing from a, an imagery viewpoint rather than a textual viewpoint. For behold, behold is an interjection. It's like, look, you know, it's like, pay attention. So you do that, pay attention. And look, look at what is happening. And the name of God that's given to us is Yehovah Tzavaot. Yehovah Tzavaot. Now, this is a very major name of God. And as Yehovah Tzavaot means, God is the commander of his hosts, the, 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 the angels that serve him. And in the book of Malachi, we also look at God as Yehovah Svaot, as the, the nation who serves him, the priesthood as well. And so host, in this case, would mean that those who serve God. Now, in this particular chapter, God is paying attention to Jerusalem and Judah, which tells us that this is with regard to the southern kingdom which is why we say that this is most likely a, a message that's directed to them after the fall of the northern kingdom. Now, this word, take away, take away the stock and the store, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water. And the word take away here gives us this picture uh, to cause cause to turn aside. But cause to turn aside, these things don't quite make sense. So cause to turn aside actually gives us a picture of removing a removal. Now, once you talk about a removal, that would be the visual that we should get. Remove the things away from Jerusalem and Judah. That, that would be the way to look at this verse. Take away what? Now, this word stock and store actually comes from the same word, the word for support, right? The word for support. And, and we, we see this, the supply, the support. 
And it comes from the idea of a staff. Now, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm chapter 23, uh, his rod and his staff, they comfort me. Uh, that would be the idea, the staff, the, the, the one that gives support when you walk. Right? That's the picture of the stock. The store comes from that same idea uh, where we're talking about the, the, the support as in sustenance. And so these words actually come from the same meaning as support, sustenance, supply. And in this idea of verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, God is saying that to Jerusalem and Judah, be aware that everything to do with Lachem and Mayim, Lachem and Mayim will be taken away. Now, this is with regards to bread, and you would be familiar with the, the word, the name of a town called Bethlehem or Bethlehem, the, ho the, the house of bread. So, Lachem would be bread. And that would be Lachem. And Mayim would be water. And, and this would give us a, 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 a cultural view of nourishment, of sustenance. For example, in our culture, uh, we would not use bread as a sustenance. We would, we would refer to rice, right? Because we eat rice. Uh, but in the, mid, the Middle Eastern culture, in, in the culture of Judah and Jerusalem, bread that comes from wheat, uh, and, and bear in mind, wheat and rice are both grass, and uh, both of us use it differently. So you can't eat wheat even if you boil it, uh, but we can eat rice when we boil it. So our sustenance will be water and rice, and the sustenance for Judah and Jerusalem will be bread and water. And he says, the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the diviner, the elder, the captain of 50, an honorable man, the counselor, the artisan, the expert and chanter. All of these are pairs of words. We need to break this down a little bit. Uh, first of all, Gibor, right? This is Gibor. And we will come by it again later on. Gibor would be a mighty man, a man of valor, right? A man of valor, man of war, man who goes and fight at war. And that would be the same meaning. And so we would have in our possession here an A and a B, right? This is a pair that if you are a hero, a, 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 a mighty man, a man of war that you can go and fight, then we say judge. Judge would be one who would, who would deal with decisions. And a prophet would be one who tells you about decisions. So the, the common denominator would be valor, would be decisions. A diviner and elder would talk about wisdom. A diviner is a word that, that depicts somebody who can actually understand the, the signs, the times, and be able to tell. Now, you need to understand that in the, in the aspect of the, the Torah, uh, the, the people of God was never uh, encouraged to look for diviners. Uh, but the idea of a diviner would be somebody who do not depend on God, but depend on themselves to be able to tell the signs and wonders. Uh, the captain of 50, an honorable man. In verse 3, would be a captain of 50 would be somebody who has, what should we say? Uh, who is noble. An honorable man would be someone whose face is lifted. Honorable, right? Noble. And so this is about honor. All right. And then we have the counselor, 
one who give advice uh and the other one is an artisan now we, we use the word artisan but i think we probably can can think of things of being skillful counselor would be the one who gives advice uh skillful would be the one who can make things and so i i would think that our common denominator would be an advice an expert and chanter would be one who would how would you call it expert would be someone who understands uh and understands enchantment would be uh whispers the word is whisper it can mean prayer it can mean uh someone who how should we say we could it could mean someone who can uh who who would be able to say intelligent words right intelligent words and so all of these would be ability to 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 discern okay and 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 what i was trying to point out to you is that all of these are an imagery the words are used in a way where uh god is saying all these people who are capable who are looked up to uh they they're not going to be around they're not going to be around verse 4 we are going to come across some very challenging verses he says i will give children to be their princes babes shall rule over them and now these are a and b as well uh and 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 it's it's important for us to note all this a and b because they they are saying the same thing with slightly different nuances so if you look at verse 4 i will give children to be their chiefs i guess the word chief sar this is sar this would be the leaders and why children to be their leaders and babes uh and babes to rule over them this this would be well how would you say babes this would be people who are naive or innocent and children to rule over them this would be ideas of people people who do not know i would say the 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 instructions of god then they are the innocent or we will call it innocent or naive they haven't learned the the rules of god and god is going to place these people as their leaders now what what's going to happen would be that it would come upon in time where there are people who who don't know the the torah who do not know the law of god and they would be the ones who would rule over the people and what's that going to happen they would be actually running around with as lawless i would say right as lawless the people will be oppressed everyone by another everyone by his neighbor the child will be insolent toward the elder the base toward the honorable these are a and b right everyone by one another everyone by his neighbor a and b and this is about oppression so we need to know what it means by oppression the word oppress is nagas and it gives us a picture of a taskmaster that would be a picture of when the egyptians were taskmasters over the israelites after joseph had passed on so that's the understanding of oppress uh to 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 exert demands now just understand that when we talk about 
the people. We're talking about the people in Judah and Jerusalem. And you find that these are people who would rise up and they would become their masters, their taskmasters, not just a master. Uh, everyone by another, everyone by his neighbor. The child will be insolent. The word insolent here would, uh, how would we say? Insolent would be to behave arrogant. That would be a good word. Behave arrogant. Toward the elder, toward the elderly, right? Uh, the, the, the elder would be the older. And what, what, what is all this happening? The base, the word base would be the one, uh, the, the dishonor, the one who is dishonored will react and behave arrogant towards the honorable, the one who is honored. What does this mean? Now, if you look at this entire passage, verse 5, the picture is this. The people will become taskmasters over another. And what happened to taskmasters is that the stronger will try to rule over the weaker. But if you look at these verses, it is unruly. You will find a picture of uh, lawlessness. Uh, that they would oppress each other. Uh, the neighbor would oppress you. The child would behave differently against the elder. And you begin to see that there is a lack of order. No order or lawlessness. Where honor to your father and mother, the honor to the elders is lost. The one who is honor is supposed to be the one who would dictate. But now it's turned around where the dishonor is going to behave arrogant against the one who is in honor. Now moving forward, verse 6. It says this, when a man takes hold of his brother in the house of his father. Now this is important because in the Hebrew, you must understand that they, they are no micro-relationship words. Uh, micro-relationship words would be uh, an uncle, uh, a cousin, a distant cousin, uh, and things of that nature. Uh, what you find in the Hebrew word would be brother, sister, father, mother. Brother, uh, yeah, brother and sister, father and mother, son and daughter. So let me just write this down, right? We have father and then mother. And then we have son. We have daughter. We also have brother. And then we have sister. Now, these are the words that the Hebrew would use in combination to describe familial relationships. And whenever you read in the Bible, you know, the uncle or the son-in-law, the daughter-in-law, all these, you will find that they are a combination of these words. When a man takes hold of his brother in the house of his father, could be the brother, could be the cousin, could be a brother of another mother, uh, and, and so on and so forth, right? And so when a man does this and says, you have clothing, be our ruler. The word ruler here is chief, right? It's, it's about being a chief, be a commander. You have clothing, be a commander and let this ruins be under your power, or under your hand, so to speak, right? Under your hand. The word ruins here, would be decay. This would be decay or something that stumbles. And basically you find that uh, it would be a time where there is no more law and order. They're, they're, they are now looking at 
who is going to govern. Uh, and, and you know this is important for us to understand, uh, which we, we, we seldom think about it. In the order where God has given to Israel, God has given to Israel the guide and instruction to authority. Who is going to be the one ruling? Who would, how would the children live and react? How you deal with your neighbor? Uh, who would be the judge? Who would be the king? Who would be the priest and the high priest and, and so on and so forth? And what, what is happening here is that things are falling apart. They are trying to clamor to somebody just to rule them. Why? Because things are in chaos. In that day, he will protest. He says, I cannot cure your ills. In, in, in verse 2, uh, verse 7, uh, ills. Uh, would be the, 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 the how should we say, uh, this person is saying that I, I do not want to leave. Why? Because there is no more food, no more clothing. Don't make me a ruler of the people. You see, in, in society, when things are in chaos, there is a natural gravitation to somebody who is rich, uh, somebody who has material to become the ruler. But that is not how God works. And, and what you can see is even now, people do not want to lead. And this is a continuation of lawlessness. And it is actually giving us a picture of a time where Jerusalem and Judah is going to encounter serious problems in society. And this is a time where the enemies are coming in. For Jerusalem stumbled and Judah fallen. Now this one gives us a better picture. What do you mean by stumble? The word stumble here means to stagger. To stagger means, you know, when you, when you are walking with weak knees, uh, you're not walking straight. And uh, this is a picture uh, given to us uh, when they, they can't stand on their own. Judah has uh, fallen, and this is literally to fall, to fall into ruins, right? To fall down. And you get another A and B. This is a state where they are totally unstable. I hope you get the picture it's trying to paint. And the reason why they are unstable, they are fallen, they are falling down. They are not walking straight. So God gives them the reason. Why? Because their tongue and their deeds, this doing is deeds. And speech are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. Let's break this down first. The word provoke here is to show rebellion show rebellion or disobedience. And the idea is uh, this is what comes from the word mara, right? Uh, to be bitter, uh, to, to, to complain, to have a bitter attitude. And when it says the eyes of his glory, this is an idiom. That God is not like that, and they are going against a glorious God. And in a way, I think you could see a picture that they behave to, um, how should we say, to put God in the eye. Maybe you could say that, uh, that 
and and and, and the 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 judgment that God is making is this. The concrete picture is the tongue and the the deeds, the things that they do, right? The things that they do. You will notice that God doesn't haul them up for a mere attitude. God hauls them up because the attitude has generated something concrete, which is in their speech and their deeds. And this is a result of an attitude. And so the judgment is on these things. And that's the evidence of what they have done rather than in their mere thoughts. Verse 9. The look on their faces, okay? This is faces. Uh, and, and it's important. The, uh, we, we, we always have big words in the Bible sometimes. Uh, we don't use the word countenance. And sometimes we wonder, why do we not use the word faces? Why use countenance? The, these are old English words that, that, that gives the majesty to the text, the English text that we read, all right? Now, the first word, uh, look. The word look is appearance. Uh, I think you could also use the word expression. What do you mean expression? Their facial, their facial expression is what this verse is talking about. How their face reveals all their wrongdoings. And so it says witnesses against them. Witness would be an eyewitness. A testimony. And so God says, no, you're, it shows in your face. You can't even hide it. They declare their sin as Sodom, as in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? As in Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and they declare, what, did, what do they declare? They, they report. When you talk about a report, it's something very evident, right? It is something evident. They do not hide it. And so what do we have here? We have A, B, and C saying the same thing, but in this case, three times. What is it that they are saying? God is saying that everything they do is very evident. That's, that's what God is holding them to. Woe. The word woe here is also an old English word. Um, I think in our, in our times as Orientals, um, this would be a cry of grief or despair. Uh, something similar to, you know, that, that, that would be the word woe. Woe to their soul, the nefesh. Their entire being, right? For they have brought evil upon themselves. Again, the word evil here is ra'a. Ra'a comes from the word ra. And I have tried to explain to us many times that evil, it does not automatically mean morally bad. But what is dysfunctional in the eyes of the beholder. And so in this case, evil upon themselves would be evil in their own eyes. They have brought evil upon themselves that in their eyes, they can see that it is dysfunctional. That is not what they want. And what is it that they don't want? And in this case, I, I would presume that it would be the punishment, right? It would be the punishment. And that would seem evil in their eyes. They brought it upon themselves because of all the evil that they have done. That would be the picture. Now, let us go to verse 10. 
Now, verse 10 is a change of tempo. Verse 10 tells us this. In verse 8 and 9, it talks about the fact that they have visually and evidently done things that they cannot deny. They can't hide. And so verse 10 tells us, say to the righteous that it will be well. Say to the righteous that it will be well. For they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Now, they would be obviously the righteous, okay? Now, the righteous is the just, the sadiq, right? The just, the lawful. Uh, in short, they are the ones who is right by God. That, that's what righteous is. A person is called righteous because he is living right or he is doing right before God or doing what God says is right or doing what God says that he should do. And that's the, the broad understanding of the word righteous. And it says, say, tell this righteous, uh, tell this righteous uh, that everything will be well. Now, what is well? The well, the word well here is tov. Tov is the opposite of ra, right? Evil is ra. Tov is good, right? Good. And again, good is good in the eyes of the beholder. And when it's good in the eyes of the beholder, it would be what is functional. Now, to the righteous, what is functional would be in, in the righteous mind that things are going right and well with them, that things are going smooth for them, that they are not being, uh, be, be, uh, th that there is no calamity upon them. That's what it means by well here. For they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Now, understand, eat is literally eat. Fruit is literally fruit. As an idiom, they would be able to enjoy the results of what they have done. What have they done? These are deeds that they have made, right? They are, they, these, these are things that they have done, that the, what they practice. What are they practicing? Righteousness, right? And so when they enjoy the fruit of their labor of whatever they do, they will enjoy righteousness. That, that's the picture here. Now, when you look at the opposite, which is verse 11, woe or ayah, right? To the wicked. The word wicked is rasha and we translate as wicked, as ungodly. But the, the, the picture of wicked would be one who departs from the right way. And so what does it, what, what will happen would be this. If he departs from the right way as opposed to the righteous, it shall be ill. And the word ill, you would guess it would be ra. It would be evil. It would be dysfunctional. Now, what, what is this saying? The reward of his hands shall be given him. By the way, the word reward in verse 11 uh, would be the, the, the recompense, the, um, the, what would be a good way? What is deserving, right? What is deserving of his hands, what he has done, right? It will be what is this? It will be accomplished for him. It will be given him. It will be made for him. Right? Made for him. Uh, and, and the picture here is this. Whatever both has done, 
if you look at this, and this, each has done their own thing. And so God will reward them based on what they have done. And their recompense would be what they would enjoy corresponding to their position before God, whether you have done it right or you have done it wrong. And that would be the, the, the teaching in verse 10 and 11. And God says, as for my people, children are their oppressors. Women rule over them. Oh, my people, those who lead you, cause you to do wrong, destroy the way of your paths. Now, this would be an application towards the people of God. Who is the people of God? Judah and Jerusalem. And so in verse 12, it says, um, my people, the oppressors, who are their oppressors? The oppressors are the ones who drives them, who, who, let's see, the, my people, it says here, the kinsmen are their oppressors. I think the word children is a bit misleading here. Um, the word children would be the, 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 in the people, right? In, oh, it's about the people, about those who are their oppressors. I don't think the word children exists in the text. Uh, it says that my people oppress Right, my people oppress, and uh, yeah, he says, My people are the oppressors, the women rule over my people. Now, this is a, a, a problematic verse, and let me explain to you why. The word rule here, uh literally means to have dominion. Now, in the Hebrew context, we need to be very clear that the head of the family is the man. And, 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 and that is how it works. And then you have the children. And above the children would be the man and the woman, and the absolute head of the family will be the man. Now, what is, what is sad in verse 12 is that in the oppression, we find an anomaly. And the anomaly is that the woman is ruling over the man. And that would be what, what I think we are looking at, um, an anomaly of the rule of God, right? An anomaly of the rule of God. Uh, in modern day, I think, we, we have a phrase, I'm not sure whether you've heard of this phrase, that while the man may appear to be the leaders, the, the woman uh, is the neck of the man. And so the man can say anything they want, but the turning of the head is done by the woman. And, and that's the, I think that would be the modern picture here for, for, for verse 12. Oh, my people, those who lead you, and the people who lead uh, cause you to err. What does this mean? Uh, the, the people who, who, who help us walk. I think this would be how it is using. Uh, the, 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 the people who help us walk, walk straight who's supposed to help us walk straight is leading us to wander away. Now, we'll take one step back and look at the, the whole picture again. The word destroy here would be to... 
how would we say this? It's not really destroy. It is to, to, to devour. That is a very imagery word, to devour, to swallow uh, the way of your paths. And by the way of your paths, we're talking about the right paths. Okay, And so if you take one step back, you can now see that this particular phrase is that when they are supposed to walk straight, when the people who are leading is supposed to guide them uh, to do the right thing, they are they are led to do everything that is wrong. And the women who rule is wrong. The people who lead is wrong. And so this, this entire picture of verse 12 is completely um, the reverse of how God would want them to live. Now, very quickly, we get to our last segment for today. Verse 13. It says, the Lord stands up to plead and stands to judge the people. Now, we need to unpack this a little bit. Verse 13 stands, stands is to take a stand, right? Take a stand. Take a stand is a very deliberate action. God is taking an action and the word plead is to contend, uh, is to is to argue, right? Is to argue. Uh, where do we see this word in before? Okay. Um, this is to contend, to argue, uh, as in a is as in as in a legal suit, uh, suit right? Uh, that that God is, um, how would you say he he is actually accusing, right? And, and he stands to judge the people. Stand here would literally be standing up. To judge the people. And here we have another A and B. It talks about God taking a position to sort this out with his people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people his princes. Now, this is the accusation. So if you think of it as like a court case, right? Now, we have God as judge and jury as well as uh, the, the prosecutor. So you look at God right now as the prosecutor. He will enter into his judgment with the elders of his people who are sitting by to listen to this and his princess, and he says, you have eaten up the vineyard, the plunder of the poor is in your houses. Is another A and B. What does it mean? When you look at verse 14, it says that you have, the word eaten up is consumed, but I think a better word is, uh, is burned up, right? To consume, but to burn up. To burn up the vineyard, and then it says to plunder. Uh, and the word plunder here is to take spoil. Take spoil of the poor. Now, I think you're beginning to see the picture here. The, the poor are the ones who is afflicted. They are the ones who are needy in your houses. If you take one step back and look at this, we are now seeing God accuse them of Hamas. Injustice. Accusing them of mistreating the poor the needy, they eat up the vineyard. And you know, there is a law uh, uh, where when you harvest, you have to leave the gleanings on the floor uh, so that the poor and the needy and the foreigner is able to pick things up to eat. But here it says, you have burned up everything that's left on the floor. Meaning you're being unjust. 
God wants the needy, the poor to be taken care of, but with dignity. And what have they done? They have plundered, they have taken everything from the poor. They have burned up everything where the poor can't even find to fend for themselves. And God says, what do you mean by crushing my people? Now, the word crush here is to oppress. Uh, let's see, what's a good word here? To break in, to bruise. To bruise, uh, to break, break into pieces, my people. It says grinding the faces of the poor. The word grind, uh, how would you say grind? Eh? Grind also has a picture of crush. Uh, you know, you know when, 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 when you take, this is crush as well. This is very similar to when you, if you've got pepper and you put it, peppercorn and you put it into a, 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 a container and you crush it into powder. And that's what it means. You crush the faces. Verse 15. You crush the faces of the humble, the poor. The needy, says the Lord God of hosts. And, and this is another A and B. This is another form of injustice. When they are down, you step on them. Uh, you, you, you embarrass them. You cause them to lose dignity. That's the accusation of uh, the, the Lord of hosts. Uh, and it's important for us to take stock of this. We seldom think about all these words. And, and these are all very grave and solemn imagery where the, the accusation is that God's people in Judah and Jerusalem are ill-treating, mistreating unjustly treating, dishonoring, uh, causing them to lose dignity. Causing who? And I want to just point out to you, the poor, the needy, the afflicted, those who can't fend for themselves are supposed to be taken care of properly by the people of God. It is to let them know that these people, although they may be poor and afflicted and needy, and cannot help themselves, they have dignity too. That they, they have pride and they have to live with dignity and be treated with dignity. And as such, the law of God gives them the law of gleaning, uh, the law where you help the poor and needy and fend for them and give them the justice. That is what God is accusing them. Verse 16 and 17, our last two verses. Moreover, the Lord says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty. Haughty means proud. And walk with outstretched necks, high-headed, and wanton eyes. How do you describe wanton eyes? Uh, I think the word here would be you know, wanton eyes literally means blinking. And I think it gives us a picture of seduction. Seductive eyes, right? Walking and mincing as they go. Now, what do you mean mincing? Uh, the word here is to take, to skip, skip along. Take little steps. Making a jingling of their feet. Uh, the jingling here with their feet, I think that would be shaking their feet bangles. All right? And this will give you the same picture 
all here, okay? This entire chunk is to describe the, the character of the women in Judah and Jerusalem. And God is accusing them now. And therefore, the Lord will strike with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will uncover their secret parts. Now, what does this mean, uncover their secret parts? Um, I think, how would you say secret parts? Um, things which are secret. Uh, basically, the whole idea is to uh, cause them to be naked. All right? This whole phrase. And then, strike with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. The scab actually is, what do you call a scab? Um, a scab would be, well, a, a form of a skin disease, actually. Uh, it's, 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 it's a form of a skin disease. Uh, maybe like leprosy, right? A scab. And the idea given us here is to show us that God is going to take away their dignity, their pride. Right? The haughtiness, the way they strut around like a peacock. And God says, I will make it such that you have everything you have needs to be covered. And whatever you have covered, it will be disclosed. And that would be the contention of God up to verse 17. And so you can see that God is now making an accusation as a prosecutor against the men and now against the women. Now, we would, we would take a break here and we will continue on Monday uh, as we carry on from verse 18 all the way to the end of chapter 4. And with this, uh, we end our session today.